I'm finished. Thank you, yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Lawson, for your wise words. Dr. Vinilal, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, I also like to begin by uh, my gratitude to uh, Professor, uh, President of uh, California University, and I would like to, of course, extend my thanks as well to uh, the Office of the Provost and the staff, uh, and. Uh, Professor Avina has Now, of course, all kinds of reasons that should be obvious by for the remarks all kinds of he has already made. Uh, but I have to say that he has wonderfully laid the ground for yeah. some of my yeah. remarks. Right. Uh, I am um, going to I have to say uh, he has made some remarks. To, to, um, I am uh, going to, in the first instance, uh, uh, offer a very brief historical perspective. Uh, and then, towards a conclusion, I would like to um, address a an aphorism, if I may put it this way, that appears on many statues uh, of Gandhi, um, including the one I believe that is my message. Okay. To try to understand what that might put. Um, so let me first begin by saying that, you know, we, uh, and Reverend Lawson has spoken about this quite often. Um, I've heard him mention this many times, that he has some reservations, rightfully so, with the Insisted on, I think, but of course, and then they gone, as it were, after for some little bit time for after the assassination of Martin Luther King. But we're really speaking about, let's say, the period from 1956 to, you know, let's say the late 60s, which was the most intense period. But I want to suggest that, particularly when we're looking at it in relationship to Gandhi, we have to really think about the 1920s, early 1920s. And so, when I speak of the long civil rights movement, I'm really thinking of the period from 1920s through the 1960s, which in my judgment is the richest period in American history with respect to the contribution of African-American intellectuals, activists, musicians, writers, the vast number of whom all had an engagement with Gandhi in one way or the other. Let me give you one brief illustration of that, and then I'll go back to my point. So we have all heard of the great poet coming out of the Harlem Renaissance, Langston Hughes. Right? Now Langston Hughes was someone who in his younger days and until the 30s was deeply committed uh, to uh, communism. Uh, and in fact, he, he paid a visit to the Soviet Union. Um, and he, in 1932, said, goodbye Christ which I'm going to read out very briefly, and then we'll see what happens 10 years later, which is really quite remarkable. So he says, goodbye, Christ Jesus, Lord, God, Jehovah, be it on away from here now. Make way for a new guy with no religion at all. A real guy named Marx, communist, Lenin, peasant, Stalin, work, worker, me. I said me. Go ahead on now. You're getting in the way of things, Lord, and please take the Saint Gandhi with you when you go. Right? So, so we see from this point that Langston Hughes had no time for Gandhi at this point, and when he writes his poem, Goodbye Christ, in 1932. Um, now, in 1943, right, so 11 years have intervened in between, and of course, those 11 years represent the sea chain in the world in many ways. World War II had come there. Uh, one of the things that Langston used in 1932, but he was certainly aware of that in 1943, was the atrocities that had been committed 
uh, in the Soviet Union uh, under Stalin. All of this had come to light. But but what was very clear was that that it was apparent to everyone that that violence, the crushing burden of violence, was something that humankind had to deal with. So in 1943, he writes a poem called Gandhi is Fasting. And he says, Mighty Britain, tremble. Let your empire standard sway. Let it break entirely. My Gandhi fast today. And he doesn't just say Gandhi fast today. He says, my Gandhi. It's a manner in which he's almost taken possession of Gandhi, that this is my man for the day now. Right? You may think it foolish that there's no truth in what I say, that all of Asia is watching as Gandhi fasts today. I mean, it's what George Orwell wrote after the assassination of Gandhi when he said that, you know, look, I mean, I have some reservations about this person, but it's quite extraordinary. This man would go on a fast and the whole world would come to a standstill. Right? I mean, how, how did he achieve this miracle time after time? Right? And, and the point goes on. So now we can see what an extraordinary change in one of the leading writers of the United States. Someone who has come to a very different understanding of Gandhi. And I think that when we study Gandhi intensely, I would submit that this kind of thinking about Gandhi, our thinking really begins to evolve. We begin to un have a deeper appreciation of what he's about. But let me go back very briefly. I had, I had said that this long civil rights movement, as I'm de describing it, really begins in the early 1920s in some fashion, when W.B. Du Bois, um, who edits a journal uh, published from, by the NAACP called The Crisis, and he's really the founding editor, he really made the journal his own uh, uh, for, for a couple of decades. Uh, in 1922, he writes the first of 18 long articles on Mohandas Gandhi. All right, the first of the 18 long articles. And the last one is 1959, just shortly before his death in Kantna. Um, so he had a lifelong engagement. And once again, we're talking about someone who, who was really a non-believer. He's an atheist, he's a communist, but yeah, and he knows the kind of profound religiosity that Gandhi embodies, but this doesn't come in the way. I mean, there's a very interesting conversation that Gandhi has with an atheist, um, and the book is called An Atheist with Gandhi, which describes a manner in which Gandhi said that, well, you know, when you when you think about satya, truth, it encompasses everyone. And that is why he always, he moved from the formulation, God is truth.